So in order to approach human processing more accurately, and to attempt to describe it effectively, we have to begin by conducting a series of shifts in our perspective, careful, deliberate shifts that will gradually compound and become more elaborate as I move forward. And in order to address the substance of what I have to describe, we have to step back to a suitable vantage point in order to see what we are talking about, and then move in on it from there and examine it more clearly. But we need to begin by assessing and evaluating a number of substantive, essential features of our reality that are incumbent in a routine and continual way upon the way that that processing is conducted, and ask ourselves questions about the role that these features play in shaping the character and nature of that phenomenon. In other words, we have to start by examining the context in which that processing occurs, and ask ourselves about the abstract shape that that context enforces upon what is taking place, in the same way that the physics of water pressure and air density can imbue a bubble of air under water with a tendency to be round, and move towards the surface, or the way that temperature can cause molecules of the same type to disperse and shift the material into different phases and forms. We have to try and perceive these forces and conditions more clearly in order to guide and inform the way our analysis is conducted. And if we establish the circumstances in which that processing takes place and by what burdens it is constrained, if we can ask ourselves what is incumbent upon it and by what it is bound, we can more clearly examine both the nature of that function and the ways in which it is possible, probable, likely, and so on for that function to be manifested. In order to get to the deeper meanings and the underlying mechanics to observe the governing and essential dynamics of the system, we have to account for as many of its components as we can observe and identify them carefully. And when we connect these observations and our hypotheses about their implications and their connections to each other to what core scientific observations have been demonstrated and established, we will be some di significant distance closer to achieving an understanding of how the brain itself and the human being within it, along with any of their respective components, actually work at all. And we have to start, too, by distinguishing this procedural operational context from the sort of context we tend to think of when we think of a particular subject's environment or situation or circumstances, the narrative features and factors, the events of one's day or in a broader sense of one's life, the sort of overt intuitive context that we think of as salient. I think it's easy for most people to relate to the idea that some life event or some uh, conditions of hunger or anger can distort or intrude on the way processing takes place, but we should ask what things contribute to the manifestation of that processing which are not as easy to recognize uh, that must uh, play a part in our constructions. We have to examine the nature of context itself and ask ourselves how the essential mechanics of existence are connected with the ability of processing to take place coherently and how we are commonly and individually adapted to interact with those mechanics in a way that suits not only the outcomes of that processing, but also the means by which that processing morphs and shifts in method as it goes in order to conduct itself efficiently. So we're going to start stepping towards a vantage point from which the things I'll be talking about later in the course will be more easily seen. And the first few lectures here will be about how to approach the question productively in order to begin constructing an appropriate framework within which we can start analyzing and interpreting uh, subjective experience, behavior, interactions, and so on. Uh, this lesson, to some extent, is about complexity, but in a broader way, it's also about the complex body of influences that allow us to intuitively and with an eerie familiarity and ease derive simplicity and coherence from both the world we live in and the world within ourselves. And the entirety of that body of influences is manifested in a structure like this one here. But before we talk about how something like this is arranged and by what rules it is governed and the conditions that that promotes, we have to back up and start examining the environment within which it evolved and some salient features of the physical and informatic makeup of that environment. So we have to ask some big questions in setting up our approach, asking how we understand subject and environment, behavior, thought, cognition, urges, emotions, and so on. And as we go, I will try to make room in which to raise some of them, but as we construct a model for what the human being is and how it works, if we are to have any hope of that model being able to inform us or enlighten our understanding in any way, uh, 
we must begin with a large and complex view of the essential function of that phenomenon. So if nature is going to build a living computational machine that can make sense of and alter information flow, gradually from the most rudimentary nervous systems on into something like the human brain, what are the conditions under which that construction takes place? What are the conditions which the brain, in the course of its processing and in the concurrent course of its self-construction in order to process, will assume and rely on as features of the natural world? And we'll see going forward that some of what the brain predicts is fluid, some of it is fixed, some of it is ostensibly fixed when in fact it is fluid and vice versa. Uh, some of it is Im implicitly but inaccurately predicted, etc. And uh, these are some of the trickier things about being human. But there are a number of these factors uh, that I think are seen within a view of the inherent complexity involved in the task which as we will see is preserved even invoking very simple conditions. So we're talking about a shift in perspective that begins with appreciating the enormous complexity of the task we're trying to describe. And I'm gonna get into what that task actually looks like in the next video, but for now I want to just frame and define the problem a little more clearly by going through a number of dimensions of complexity and exploring the way in which each of them defines and dictates and shapes the way processing can take place as a natural phenomenon. Now as we move forward, uh, things will get into theoretical and I think for some challengingly abstract and esoteric territory fairly quickly here. And I will, as I said in the introduction video, try and keep things as grounded as possible through very prosaic, relatable examples and word pictures, uh, thought experiments, comparisons, analogies, and so on. Um, but Complexity is something that's strangely difficult to talk about because our brains traffic in simplicity. We rely on simplicity, complexity is challenging, complexity is hard, and the complexity of complexity itself, or kind of nested or recursive or concurrent complexity, is that much more challenging. Um, and I think it's important to start not just by observing and taking note of complexity or trying to add it up and account for it, uh, but by also appreciating that complexity itself is a substantive and ubiquitous feature of our reality and the universe we live in. And the broadest sort of takeaway uh, from this lecture is that every single thing, component, and aspect of and about the human experience is fundamentally much, much more complex than you think, and it's even more uh, orders of magnitude more complex than that. Uh, but for now it's enough to start with to recognize that complexity is essential and ubiquitous, um, that it is preserved at scale, meaning that any aspect, layer, or scale of the reality we can observe is essentially complex, that it is demonstrated both compositionally and through iteration and variation over time, which is something that we'll explore as we go forward here and that it is compounded via contextual connection, which I'll discuss in a moment. Uh, these precepts may not seem particularly helpful at the moment, but as I illustrate them, I hope their utility uh, will become more clear. And as we go, it's important to distinguish the manifest complexity of something like our galaxy, or indeed the entire universe, which is to say the complexity of what exists from the complexity of what features and components of reality promote that existence in the form in which we find it, which is to say the complexity of existence. So if we assert that the complexity of something that exists has to do with its composition and its relationship to other things that exist, there is an underlying set of physical rules and laws by which that existence is governed and the complexity of that abstract dimension is what we're working on here. Uh, trying to view both of them at once in order to infer and establish an accurate model of those rules while specifically checking our work against what we can observe. And to give some sense of what we're trying to achieve here and how far we have to go, consider what it takes to go conceptually from your existence at a specific point on the surface of the earth with the intuitive and seemingly self-evident and self-explanatory body of information uh, in which we are each continually immersed, 
to wrapping your mind around a series of abstract quantities that include that planet and its geography using tools for reference, portrayal, and communication, which include everything from a child's drawing and primitive maps to sophisticated maps and globes to GIS mapping, along with the sum total of scientific knowledge about every aspect of the Earth, including its weather, movements within space, composition of chemical elements, the substance of its layers and core, the movement of its crust, etc., and for the abstract quantity of what such information there is to know, which is to say the total informational capacity of the system. In any endeavor to understand anything at all in a way that represents a commitment to empiricism, reason, evidence, and all the other components of a scientific methodology, our goal, in essence, is primarily to make smaller the difference between those last two quantities, what there is in the world as it is, and what there is in our capacity to model and account for it in a way that can summarize or essentialize it into a form that is transmissible within the brain of that person who occupies an infinitesimal position and represents a component quantity within that system itself. So to go along with the metaphor I've invoked here, it is up to us not only to define and assess the underlying features of and influences on the reality to which we are subject, and to connect them together in a way that is our most representative approximation of how they actually do fit and harmonize, but we also have to lay this groundwork effectively and get as much of it done as we can before it makes a great deal of sense to be analyzing and interpreting very much about what we see on the image itself. So to simplify, what we're really just saying here is that analyzing the one relies on a foundation built from properly analyzing and understanding the other. And I submit very nearly all of what human history has produced to date on the subject of the human experience in terms of any attempt to anatomize it and account for it objectively has, for all its uh, efforts at an appreciation of substance, been caught up and concerned with what in this metaphor lies on the surface of these pieces. And it isn't to say that that work is superficial, it's to illustrate that if what you want to do is analyze an image like this that is composed in this way, if you want to know anything about one piece's relationship to another, if you want to connect with anything meaningful about the information contained in this image, it is essential that its components are properly arranged. Uh, so we're going to begin our examination of uh, these substantive features by exploring three dimensions of the complexity to which uh, existence as an animate earthly being itself is subject. Uh, static, manifest, and animate. And I have potential on this slide, because I thought it was going to be part of this lesson, but I think it'll actually be part of uh, the next one. Um, and each of us lives every instant of every moment of our lives within these constraints and boundaries. But I'll be leaving aside ourselves for the moment and examining these as broader features of existence. And the observations I'll be making relate to components of our experience and context that are so subtle and mundane and ubiquitous that they often escape being thought about or considered, but in fact, uh, as we'll see, they inform and determine a great deal of the minutia of substantive existence. And what we're talking about here is freezing the entire universe in a single snapshot of time, with everything in it frozen in place, abstracting it from animation and interaction, and focusing only on the substance of what there is within a given moment. And this view is representative of the way, I, of the way most people, I think, uh, appreciate and understand complexity. I think people are used to understanding uh, complexity as something volumetric, meaning that the word describes um, a property of containing a certain quantity of information that is, to one degree or another, overwhelming to consider or process. Uh, the idea, for example, of counting all the stars in the field of view represented by this image seems to provide a demonstration that the object depicted within it is complex. But uh, this uh, intuitive approach is, uh, to complexity is something I will invite you to discard. And you can do so on the basis of this equation, uh, which I personally don't pretend to understand exactly as well as I might like to, but to summarize, this is called the Bekenstein or Bekenstein bound, uh, 
and it represents a way to account for the total information of a finite physical system. So you can actually take a system of a given volume and use its mass to determine the number of possible quantum states within it, meaning the binary ones and zeros of quantum energy levels, and you can use the number of those states to determine what is the informational capacity of that system. And you can also do so by embracing the importance of null values in informatic systems, which means that to use our universe as an example, even vast reaches of empty space, which we know are not quite as empty as they might seem, have an essential value to the system even if we assure ourselves that they are theoretically purely empty because their placement and relational values contribute an influence and maintain a kind of pressure on the system's parameters. So in essence, not only can you not have a bubble without air inside of it to act outwards on the surface tension of the material, you also can't have that same bubble, even abstracting away everything that allows that bubble to exist in the material world, without areas of space which that air is able to occupy, even if it doesn't happen to do so, and even if that space doesn't happen to be surrounded by the substance that allows us to identify the shape of this particular bubble. And to put it another way, it illustrates the importance of ostensibly empty space, specifically in the way that it feeds back on and provides avenues and spaces for that space to be occupied. So if photons from a source are moving in a direction, whether that space is occupied or not, whether it will be or not, and whether, whether it has been or not, whether something competes to occupy that space, etc., all have an important influence on what takes place and what can, and how those things will influence the system and have room to manifest that influence. So even if we determine a finite quantity of space to be empty, we can say that that same parcel of space is in that case occupied by and filled with emptiness. And in the same way that air acts outwards on a bubble, the existence of that emptiness acts upon the system to comprise an element of its integrity and promotes its tendency towards stability. And we can see then that in any finite system, we do not have such things as objects in empty space. We do not have areas of importance and unimportance, i.e. significance and void. What we have is a specific dispersal and distribution of information that can be described relationally, both to each other and adjacent areas in which it can distribute its influence and its activity. So there is a kind of bottom limit to the informatic effect of, on a system of a null-valued space. And if we describe this voxelographically, we can observe something else about these null-value spaces, which is that as they become populated with binary values, we can see that all these empty spaces, while equally empty and, and in equal measure comprised of the same emptiness, they are not themselves identically empty because of their relationship to values in adjacent spaces. I.e., this same space here uh, is not identically empty to this space here uh, because of their distance from areas of non-emptiness, and that fact is itself a property of these spaces. If we animate this system and determine that these positive values have the ability to shift, if we suppose that they are identifiers of forces characterized by warps and transformations in the information distribution, and therefore can themselves be observed to move, then we can observe the way in which emptiness too is transformed by this movement, meaning that voxel spaces of differentiated emptiness can themselves change in characteristics and properties because of the way those liberties and influences are dispersed. So we can imagine a kind of gravity well that surrounds each positive value and distribute out its ability to move into adjacent voxels as a probabilistic function concurrent with its properties. And we can observe that as the positive value space shifts, so shifts the properties of the null value spaces throughout the system. And in the same way that objects influence a space-time fabric, the informatic fabric of a space is warped by the position and location of information values and their effect on that medium is distributed according to the arrangement of those values. So we can start making observations about the effect of these values on a system and we can start looking at the informatic relationships between given voxels. We can establish, if we know the properties of values within that system, the rules that govern their expressions as positional iterations over a sequence, 
uh, probabilities and likelihoods that a given voxel will become occupied in an immediately adjacent sequential iteration, how that property shifts as iterations morph, and so on. And in this way we can describe the effect of information's behavioral animation within the system. And if we allow that these values represent quantities more complex than simple binary ones, if they themselves are nested with conditional functions that establish a set of attributes by which they can be distinguished from others, and we can say that those differences influence other probabilities and that they function differently because of those attributes, then we can describe further relationships and determine rules that relate to those relationships within the system too. So if we say that, that this begins with bodies of information, connections between which establish an inherent context, and that this context describes a field in which changes in that information can be manifested, and that that field has properties derived from this context, which influence the ability of those changes to manifest, and that this feeds back and warps not only the information itself, but an elaborate array of meta-information that is a product of relational information concurrent with those attributes, then we can see the way in which the each property of that body of information introduces a context in which to measure and observe it, manifesting the same effect in our analysis. So in other words, when we approach an analysis of this composition, we can identify relationships between positive value voxels, which contain specific information, and we can further describe conditional relationships based on attributes, which are a separate body of information, we can connect these observations to each other and make further observations about the relationship between these as bodies of information. And in this way we can see the way in which the mere existence of any information whatsoever that has to occupy such a plane knocks onto and establishes significantly larger bodies of information that are derived from the fact of this existence, in addition to whatever relationship they have to information within the plane itself. So if this phenomenon in, in information flow is a property of the universe in which we live, when we nest and extrapolate and compound this function to account for not just quantum energy level states, but the consortium of these states that makes up a particle and then an atom and then a molecule and so on, we can see the way in which any particular organization of matter is comprised of massive amounts of information that is both substantively and analytically observed. And if we put the analytical meta-information in, into its own theoretical voxel space, and then start drawing connections and establishing relational information between those spaces, we can see the way in which this compounds out into infinity. So essentially then, simply from bits of information existing in a field together, you can account for massive proportions of the total information that comprises the universe, and as impact and as rules that are manifested by those properties alter this information fabric and are combined and combined so that a body of information composing an electron is substantial enough in its effects to exert forces upon the space around it, and then those subatomic particles combine according to what is possible within these rules, etc., and all the way on up into everything for which we can account. And even if it is the nature of the process of science that we cannot yet fully appreciate, observe, or understand every rule and component of this manifestation, i.e. we cannot yet fully analyze the mechanics of the universe, when we can define that universe as information, as objective, quantifiable, axiomatic data, that occupies a structural position within a framework which contains attributes and, and assert that uh, the values within this information are subject to variation over time, we can start to understand everything up to and including and beyond the context of human experience as definable in terms of relationships between bodies of information. And by the way, just as a side note, if, as I illustrated, the nature of reality is defined not only by information within the system, but relational information that exists as a property of that information's existence, it might behoove us to consider the theoretical medium of that information and the space in which those relationships between nodes and voxel space exist as a way of exploring the concept of dark matter and dark energy. And if I can casually toss off a hunch, 
it may be that a significant amount of what is unaccounted for in our observations of physical reality can be related to warps in the properties of the negative spaces within these planes and relational interactions between their non-equal emptiness. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, another discussion, I think, with people who are far better at that kind of thing than me. So if we bring all this wild, abstract theorizing back to the human level and ask ourselves what this particular dimension of complexity looks like when magnified to a human scale, we examine it by analyzing the minute detail inherent in the wildly elaborate and particularly exact behavior of a performing orchestra. If, again, we freeze such a thing in time and ask about its structure, uh, we can note immediately that there are 50 to 100 musicians, each using one or several instruments to, together, play one performance of a given piece of music. And in that there is a relationship, as I have described, between two values within some arrangement of these voxel spaces. Uh, the piece of music as it should be played, its ideal version, and the piece of music as it is actively being played by the orchestra at the point of attempt. So you've got your ticket, you're in the seat, and everyone in the room, everyone on stage, and every member of the audience is there to either provide or receive the experience of what it said on the poster. Let's say, for example, selections from Mozart. The conductor raises their hands and the music begins, and for every single aspect of the performance as it goes on, every note played and its many characteristics, there is another set of relationships to values in that other space. And the values in that other space can, for the moment, be represented by the notes on the score from which each player is playing. Uh, every page of this score contains notation for each of the parts, and each of those parts is played by a player in a section, and there be, may be several playing each part concurrently. And each of these players and each of these instruments are individual things, each with specific conditions of attri and attributes of their own. And I want to take a moment to illustrate this uh, with a couple of videos that show this variation. Before we start, I need to do two things. One is I want to remind you of what a seven-year-old child sounds like when he plays the piano. Maybe you have this child at home. He sounds something like this. Some of you recognize this child. Now, if he practices for a year and takes lessons, he's now eight and he sounds like this. And then he practices for another year and takes lessons, now he's nine. And then he practices for another year and takes lessons, now he's ten. At that point, they usually give up. <laughs> now, if you'd, waited, if you'd waited for one more year, you would have heard this. Now, what happened was not maybe what you thought, which was he suddenly became passionate, engaged, involved, got a new teacher, he hit, pu hit puberty, or whatever it is. What actually happened was the impulses were reduced. You see, the first time he was playing with an impulse on every note. And the second, with an impulse every other note. You can see it by looking at my head. The th the nine-year-old nine put an impulse on every four notes. And the ten-year-old on every eight notes. And the eleven-year-old one impulse on the whole phrase. So with this we have variation in a player's ability to execute the notes appropriately and effectively. And in the next we have a single player of very advanced skill level playing the same piece over and over on different instruments.
can see that the possibility of variation within the iterations of performance that we can measure and compare is significant. And we can see that while seemingly small, these changes and variations are the result of many, many non-fixed attributes. And each of the considerations here, and some others, bear on each of those components in a way that has an obvious effect on the music played. So in addition to their skill level, each player exists in a certain condition of health, and it's obvious that a sick player might play differently than a well one. They're each a relative level of prepared for the performance, and of course they play differently with different levels of preparation. Each instrument also has a certain construction, which has a certain value. As we have seen, uh, a Steinway objectively produces different sound than one of a lesser construction. That instrument also has an objective condition defined by its level of wear and tear, if any, the extent to which it is, and the extent to which it has been maintained. And this shifts on a micro level during play as violin bows become unrosined, brass instruments, spit valves become clogged. And most of the instruments have a level of accuracy when it comes to its calibration, whether because of the details of its manufacture or its manual attunement. Further, the sections of players have a unity and timing considerations, and there is an importance, in some cases a profound one, uh, to what level of player is playing in which seat. The combination of the entire orchestra has many of these same considerations, and the performers are often auditioned and placed in different orchestras to maintain a consistent skill level across the body of performers. This averages to an overall level of skill for the group. And the conductor who leads the entire thing has variables too. Variables for the specifics of their training and approach, their personal sensibilities and style, and how and with what context they approach the piece itself. And all of this varies from orchestra to orchestra every time this same piece of music is played from the same score with the same notes, etc. So if we start adding up and specifying the variables inherent in any given orchestral performance, everything from whether the third, second violinist had breakfast that morning to the level of hydration in the spruce wood fibers of her instrument, and so on, uh, we can determine a significant deal of variation with an ostensible similarity. In short, if we added up the differences in every component, even if the similarities were enormous, and the sort of Venn diagram overlap between two versions of a played piece of music was very great, we could observe the extent of that variability and determine probabilities of variation for any given attribute in any given iteration. And two, if we took all of the times this piece of music had ever been played and stacked those on top of each other, there would be a core of overlap that defines the piece itself, and that could give us a reference for how the piece is and can be played. Uh, so we'll actually take some time to examine this with some specimens here, and we're going to listen to about 30 seconds of several different performances with specific variations of the same piece of music and look at them a little more closely. So the music in question is the opening piece, the overture, for uh, Mozart's opera The Marriage of Figaro, uh, a popular piece of music you may be likely to recognize, and this is it here. Okay, and this is a good uh, example, a reasonable uh, representation. And again, what happens at every point as every moment passes and every player in the orchestra shifts their attention and behavior is dictated by what happens in the score. Mm -hmm. 
and we can simplify that score by extracting a representative component defined by that same overlap in real time, represented by the piano playing its part here. This is a computer playing through a set of stable commands within a digital audio workstation software, which I'll address in a moment. Um, so if we keep these things in mind as we look at the next two videos, we will see some of these variations. So a careful ear can hear prominent variations already, mostly in the strings, and you probably wouldn't notice without the ability to analyze things objectively in the way these videos allow, but the version we just heard was uh, actually about two seconds faster than the others we have heard so far. So therefore, if this version were in the stack of iterations which we were comparing, every common node would be offset and there would be a measurable relationship between where the notes were hit in one version relative to the others. And for clarity's sake, this, is, uh, the, this video is the New York Philharmonic playing under Leonard Bernstein, considered by many to be a high watermark of performance. So let's hear a, an equivalent orchestra, this time the Vienna Symphony. Okay, and since this video focused more on the conductor and their movements, it's worth pointing out that while a conductor's movements are a reasonably standardized language, the way Bernstein and the way that this conductor, Fabio Luisi, conduct can be vastly different, not just because of the differences in personal style and where they were trained and so on, but because their physiology performs the same movements in inherently different ways. So consider the phenomenon of telegraph operator hands, which are the equivalent of a voice in speech transmission, which can be identified by an experienced listener. Few people know, but a careful operator can actually determine who is speaking through observing the tiny variations at the peripheries of the way the dots and dashes sound. So let's hear something more substantially different now. Uh, a version performed by a state university level orchestra with younger, less experienced players playing lower quality instruments on a rehearsal run through under the direction of a different level of conductor. <laughs> So we can see these differences in performance grow as the differences between orchestras compound, and these differences can be sought within comparison of each attribute that can be identified. The orchestras, upon analysis, have significant differences, and these have a tangible relationship to the differences in the sounds produced, and there are spectra upon which each characteristic or attribute can be arranged and lines between them can be drawn. <laughs> 
So I'm going to come back to the most overt, identifiable common thread between these performances, the score which each of them deliberately follows, and start relating this back to what we spoke about a moment ago. If we start looking at these things as relationships in voxel space, we can give all of them an oriented connection to this specific arrangement of information. So if you imagine each iteration as a voxel plane, uh, and we stack them on top of each other in that Venn diagram way I alluded to, the way you can identify the relationships I've been describing is by drawing lines between them and examining the properties of those lines. And we can suppose that everything about the geometry of those lines has, has some application in our analysis, their slope, their trajectory, their length, etc. But those applications have yet to be borne out. So if, our, so if information represented by this score, appropriately arranged, gives us a series of points that make for an objective reference and metric by which we can begin drawing such lines, we can define in that same objective way not only what we mean by a performer coming in late or going flat or going sharp, but also what we mean by a piece being performed more brightly or more grandly, and we can define those subjective measures more clearly. And these comparisons can be made regardless of how we draw the boundaries around these bodies of information or by which planes in voxel space we compare. So you could compare all the versions of the same orchestra's attempts from the first rehearsals to the final performance, you could compare all performances from certain categories of performer. You could compare the same orchestra playing at different speeds and so on. And in every case, data of serious interest can emerge. So the next thing we should examine now that we have established a view of the complexity of something that exists is the complexity of the world within which it exists. And we should look at the way that that both acts as a medium for such bodies of information and actively feeds back on the way that information is itself manifest. So to begin with, we can identify the difference between the watercolor on the left and the oil painting on the right, the substantive difference in the material on which they are painted, even if we presume theoretically that the same artist could paint an identical image on each using the appropriate techniques and paints. If they used watercolors on paper for the first image and oil on canvas for the second image, even if the scenes they depicted uh, were absolutely identical in every respect, there would be a substantive difference between the two works. And if we start switching the factors around and have the same artist attempt to use the oil paints on the paper and the watercolors on the canvas, the influences of these differences would become apparent uh, very quickly. And we can abstract this from these examples a little bit by presenting a block of text, as I have on screen here, and changing the background color, like so. Uh, a subtle difference, which has some effect in some circumstances on the text's readability and therefore the intelligibility of the information, but let's see a dramatic difference. Now, I could play a prank here and leave the, just leave this slide empty, but I assure you the same text is there, duplicated exactly from the previous two slides. And when we consider this effect from within the metaphor I described, we can visualize this same theoretical orchestra playing in different spaces. If, again, we could assure ourselves that this orchestra would play the exact same notes in the exact same ways, that their instruments would function identically and so on, if we assured ourselves that everything but the environment was exactly the same in two iterations, you would hear sounds that were remarkably different in a room like this one, the auditorium where this orchestra plays, and fr from the way they would be if you could get all of them in a room like the one I'm speaking in now. And because sound is comprised of waves that move and reflect and echo and reverberate before they even arrive at our ears, uh, there is an entire subset of architectural design devoted to the shaping of performance sound that is based around providing a listener within the space an auditory experience that is specifically calibrated to the sound producing properties of the instruments which were most prevalently used within that space. So a Gothic cathedral like Notre Dame has features uh, designed for a pipe organ, 
And a Romanesque basilica like St. Peter's is designed to work with the voice, whether that of a priest conducting mass or a choir performing the liturgy. And I have it on good authority that you can actually stand in the choir vestibule at St. Peter's and project a note, and that vibrations from that note get carried up into the dome, across the nave, and bounce off the door at the entrance to be carried back again and arrive at, to the human ear, the exact same pitch. Now, such a thing is rightly considered an architectural marvel, but that engineering is indicative of the lengths to which one must go in order to maintain sound, meaning that that shape is what must be in place for that sound to be preserved in that way, and in a space of that size, the dimensions are scaled exactly to maintain that shape. Um, this slide shows the air pressure and motion within the dome of another monumental piece of architecture, St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, and at the bottom of that dome there is the famous whispering gallery, a space that allows a whispering speaker to be heard clearly 112 feet away as if the listener was sitting right alongside the speaker. So this diagram shows an analysis of the properties that allow so-called whispering gallery waves to travel in the way that they do. And with modern uh, sound design and engineering, there is an awful lot that goes into a modern concert hall or performance auditorium that is designed to preserve and make sense of a single or a few instruments, like this small room here, or something massive like the Walt Disney Concert Hall. Uh, and as you can see in these images, there is just as much attention uh, paid to where the audience sits as where the performers sit. And this space is designed to contend with the music of the more than 100 players in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And while we're at it, uh, this space will sound remarkably different on a rehearsal day when it is nearly empty and on the night of a sold out performance where you have the murmuring and even just the breathing of the 2,265 people in the seats. So as we identify these factors that distort or intrude upon the sound coming from the players of, and their instruments, we can identify any seat in this house and measure the extent to which those distortions alter the sound. And if we take one seat and say that that is where some unfortunate someone's cell phone goes off in the middle of a performance, you can actually measure the extent to which that intrudes upon the experience in seats around them, and you can map that all over the room as well. So we can see then uh, the extent of this distortion and shaping by removing it. And so here is a comparison of the sound of two balloons popping, one in a room designed to magnify reverberation and one in a room designed to minimize it. And with modern sound production software, we can actually replicate and control these effects digitally, taking an oscillation from a synthesizer and controlling the parameters to match what takes place in spaces like this. So we can say that, like the different iterations of different performances of the same piece of music, when we talk about the sound of an orchestra or the sound of a balloon, we're talking about components of the sound present in the environment as well as the body of versions that that sound can take and still be recognizable. And these again are connections in voxel space as well as bodies of information within connections between voxel space planes. And when we talk about sound itself, i.e. the way that all sound waves in all spaces behave, you're talking about another set of these same connections and bodies, meaning that you can actually identify the components of a sound wave that are warped and distorted by an environment and observe the changes in that wave as it travels differently in air and underwater, for example. So you can take a value for something like that wave's amplitude or wavelength and relate that value to its manifestation in different circumstances, and if these values are properly arranged, you can relate them to each other via a meaningful connection in voxel space that accounts for that difference. <laughs>
And if we appreciate that this effect is present in a plethora of ways within every environment to which human experience and processing are subject, and permit that such has also always been the case within the environments for which human processing was adapted, we can begin to construct that task as an adaptation for making sense of a complex environment by assessing what must take place and how in order for that processing to occur. So as things animate within the system, it is a feature of our reality that they are organized into discrete moments in time that are bound within a sequence we can observe. And at whatever resolution measured in units of time we should like to describe this procedure, we can divide animation into cells like the way a film camera captures moving images or uh, as we see in these images here. And when we overlay these images, we can see that there are specific shifts within the frame, informational configurations rearranging slightly. And if we could combine these layers into one image that was properly adjusted to center around the object of our focus, we could identify the relationships between each pixel in the frame and describe their movement from iteration to iteration, as well as things like the prob probability of a pixel space being occupied and so on. Uh, so if we apply this in not just a three-dimensional, but a fourth-dimensional way and say that time divides the human experience into discrete measures of sequence, and we allow that this analysis can be conducted, as I have described, by simply examining relationships between bodies of information in specific orientations, we can look for that same overlapping and connection and describe the salient facts about that unique body of connection and we have a substantive, objective reference, not just for human movement, but for human behavior, and we can connect this to an abstract representation of not just how one opens an umbrella, but what we mean when we describe a behavior like opening an umbrella abstractly. Because what are these discrete slices of an animate behavior but visual notations for planes and voxel spaces and what is our intuitive, implicit human understanding of what joins and unites them together, but observations about measures within these voxel space comparisons. So if we say that procedure itself gives rise to the emergence of meaning, and we say that there is something that begins in ambiguity and emerges into clarity, the same way that a paper airplane by which I mean both the physical object and all the observable information that goes along with it, as well as the idea of a paper airplane itself and all the other non-tangible information, emerges from a blank piece of paper via a certain procedure, and that there are variables within that procedure, we suddenly have a means by which to objectively interpret not only what it means for a paper airplane to be constructed, but for an umbrella to be opened, and we can see what translates one to the other as the basis of what we mean when we describe a behavior. And if we ask by what means and in what medium one connects to the other, we can see that our very interpretation of anything and the means by which we perceive, comprehend, and ideate are rooted squarely in voxel space. And if we observe, that the piece of paper from which we might build a paper airplane, or on which we might write something down, or on which we might transcribe a score for The Marriage of Figaro, contains the potential for all these things, uh, we can see that there is a version of pluripotency inherent in the material to which procedure can be applied. And we can see that these potentials and these liberties are sculpted away as one takes successive steps within a procedure and as further linear distortions are applied. But I want to note here what should already be apparent to anyone sufficiently familiar with the processes of biology, which is that the process I am describing describes the way that the very cells we are made of write themselves into reality on the basis of similar instructions for procedure which with a great deal of analysis and by applying all the rules we can determine within physics, chemistry, and biology can demonstrate and account for the way that that manifestation is conducted and if we determine that at its broadest the process of biological evolution is one that revolves around variations in genetic composition that promote an organism's ability to introduce behavioral procedure into its environment and thereby exert an influence on that environment 
then we can examine these behaviors as extensions of those strategies and we can see that brains that are capable of exerting behaviors equip their host organism in exactly the same way that an organism can be equipped by other organs or biological systems to function in, it, in its environment. But if we say that the essence of this task is to take the material available to it, by which in this case we mean the voxelographic liberties that enable transformations and manipulations in this information, and attempt to shape, sculpt, and arrange material in this other dimension, in the same way that genes do with physical material and physical space, we can ask ourselves what influence the making of a paper airplane has on that configuration's utility and the way in which the material so arranged can be arranged to access these other liberties in voxel space. So in other words, if you have to make a paper airplane before you can throw a paper airplane, and something has to be constructed in a certain way to behave in the way in which something so constructed is capable, and you have a brain that can influence the transformations inherent in that construction, as well as understand the way variations in construction contribute to that behavior and alter future attempts and iterations accordingly, being able to connect these properties to the utility one projects in voxel space is the root of tool use and, in a broader sense, behavior. Because if opening an umbrella is consistent with providing cover for one's head from rain or sunshine, and we know this as observers, and we know that the subject knows this and does so for that reason, we can observe the way that this property is nested and recursive throughout the entire fabric not only of behavior but of the way behavior is included as procedure in the rearrangement of material in reality to endow it with properties that enable further procedure. And it's clear, or at least I hope it should be, that architectures and procedures in the brain exhibit a level within this system, and that the activity within these structures are a point of connection in voxel spaces between these behaviors and a point on which they hinge. And the behavior of that activity is itself subject to procedure of its own, and that by understanding this appropriately, we can clarify and make objective through examination of changes within brain material that are concurrent with the manifestation of such procedure, a great deal of what we mean when we refer to human processing. And if we take that all of these things that we refer to often obliquely and rather fuzzily can be defined and analyzed more clearly by applying the concept of how a naturally constructed genetically influenced being processes configurations and arrangements of information throughout iterations over time by procedurally conducting voxel space analysis and behaving in a way to influence the environment on the basis of promoting changes in that analysis, then we provide ourselves with a very real way of clarifying the task we have here to work on and enable ourselves to solve these puzzles. As we move forward in this series, we will examine the fundamentals of the way we have scientifically observed this processing to occur and try to discern some of the same elements we have already described as well as those we have yet to uncover. We will ask how the massively complex reality in a subject's environment is sieved through a networked biological mesh within the makeup of that subject in order to biologically and physiologically compute this analysis and we will bring together observations both at the network and at the neuronal level that should begin shedding light on the nature and behavior of that computation. We will ask by what construction and protocols a nervous system, and by extension the body in which it lives, interacts with its environment on the basis of this processing, and we will try to examine the characteristics and nature of both that processing and that system of interaction in order to better comprehend how we can enable ourselves to understand it. And from this vantage point, we can see that our path forward is not to continue characterizing the human experience as the experience of an essentially simple being made up of complex constituent systems and parts, but instead to begin examining the ways that that complex being interacts with the fabric of reality to provide itself with a simplicity within which its processing 
can be conducted most efficiently and effectively, and by which it can coordinate and instruct its capabilities and administer its physiological resources on the basis of that processing. So we land for the moment on a point overlooking the territory in which we will conduct such an endeavor, and we will begin taking steps in the next video. Thank you for watching.